Oh, sorry. Okay. There's a crisis facing our democracy. Who has the power to solve it? Is it America's voters? Or perhaps it's America's <laughs> non -voters? In 2016, we witnessed one of our country's most contentious presidential elections. Donald Trump won the presidency. <laughs> So, Julie, why don't we start with you? I will end the screen share. Can you see me? Uh, let's make you, sorry everybody, we thought we had, we paid for the big, and we're having a little trouble because of, let's make Julie spotlighted. There you go. Good evening to all League members. I'm Julie Meir, president of the Port Washington Manhasset League, which is part of the New York State delegation. I believe strongly that our democracy can only thrive when citizens actively engage one another in civil discourse and educating voters about the issues, including about why voting matters to us as individuals, as family units, as communities, and as a nation is one of the most important conversations we can have. I am so very proud of the members of my league who take on big issues and create out of the box solutions and programs. For decades, New York State has had one of the lowest voter turnout rates in the US. Our league, the New York State League, and likely most of you, have advocated for voting reforms for years. In the spring of 2018, the New York State Legislature passed several major voting reforms, including pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds, scheduling of state primaries to coincide with federal primaries, and most significantly, early voting. With those reforms now law, our league asked ourselves, what could we do now to ensure that these reforms made a difference in areas that historically had low voter turnout? And how could we help to make sure that these reforms have immediate impact on voting numbers in our general catchment area? We noted that there were some election districts that had significantly lower voter turnout than others, and we decided to focus on those areas. This caucus describes what we did. Over the next 20 minutes or so, we will share our 2018 and 2019 actions and our evolving plans for 2020. After our presentation, we want to hear from you about how all of us can overcome the challenges of voter registration and getting out the vote during this pandemic. For those who have technical questions not answered by the presentation, please put them in the Zoom chat box or in a message on Facebook if you're watching on Facebook, and we will follow up with you. I ask you to keep your microphones and cameras off during our presentation. This meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our Facebook page immediately following the caucus. Finally, some thanks are due to Francine Furtado, who is beside, behind the scenes today. She planned this voter turnout project with Judy Esterquest, our presenter this evening. A big thank you to both of them. And to our League Vice President, Michelle Lamberti, and Voter Service Chair, Judy Jacobson, now working behind the scenes, are assisting during the discussion. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy this caucus. Thank you, 
Thank you, Julie. We appreciate that. I'm taking off your spotlight and letting you go. You might want to turn your camera off. Okay. I'm going to leave the slides on the side because I can't get it to go to my what I want it to go to. I apologize, everyone. Um, so our agenda today is they're going to talk about 2018. Julie explained that there were some important voter reforms. And we said, what can we do about it? And we wanted to canvas and get our people registered and hear about vote, early voting. We did that in some low turnout districts. Then in 2019, we canvassed again some of the very same neighborhoods. And we said, this is fabulous. And then the pandemic hit. So where are we? We're in New York on Long Island. And this red area is New York State Senate District 7. It has about 320,000 people. It's mixed. It's about 64 square miles, and it is extremely diverse, but highly segregated, as all of Long Island is. So the first thing we did was we said, where can we go? And we uh, went to the Board of Elections. In New York, precincts are called EDs and, let's see, and election districts. So the Board of Elections, we, Fran and I showed up, said, how do we do this? And they said, oh, you can get a canvassing book for the election. You have to pick it for a district. It'll be $150 in two or three weeks to print. And Fran said, oh, it's only on paper. Don't you do it electronically? Because Fran is highly green. And they said, oh, we can do it electronically. You could get it this afternoon, and it'll be PDF, and it's free. We said, good. He said, what else might we want? And they said, you'll probably want a map. And the map was 35 by 40 inches, which is surprisingly large, with all the EDs marked in about five point font. It was tiny. When we got the canvassing book and opened it up, it looked like we needed a decoder ring. So for New York, this will vary by your state. They sort the, it, the precincts by assembly district. And then inside the assembly district, they look at the town and then they have the ED. So what you have here is assembly district 13, North Hempstead, and then it'll be a 13 and then it will be the ED. Then what they list is all the registered voters and then a number that in New York is called whole voters, whole number, which is the number of votes for that election. And then they list, re Democrat, Republican, Green, Liberty Party. New York has a lot of third parties. So they list out all the third parties for each of those EDs. So we took, we got this, we looked at the map and what you'll see in a few minutes is that we took this big map, found EDs on it and then color coded them by, by how many, what their percent turnout was and looked for neighborhoods. So how do we do that? So we did an Excel spreadsheet. So our Excel spreadsheet, one of our members took two hours and an input 30 pages, about eight numbers each. So we have again, the page that it's on, the town, the assembly district, the election district, the total number who are registered, the total number who voted, we divided it and we got a turnout number. We sorted the 300 EDs by turnout and got a surprising number of zeros. Um, so then we went to see where all these things were. And this is the area of Newcastle. And as you can see, there's a bunch of these correspond to these. And we said, okay, what have we got? What, what, what's next? Um, so we said, what do we need next after we've identified district? Uh, we said we need a script. New York has a toolkit for canvassing, which is really useful. Happy to share the link with you. But we made our own script. 
We had Board of Education forums for registering voters for absentee ballots. We brought stamps because we figured in some of these neighborhoods and with people under 30, it's useful to bring postage stamps. We had literature in multiple languages. We actually have the voter registration forms in 12 languages, although there were only two or three that we actually needed. Our literature from New York State is in English and Spanish. Um, we also made some things ourselves. So we made door hangers that are customized to the district, which, which uh, offices are actually on the ballot. And when it's a small number, we'll actually put the the names, uh, how to find out more. We have the vote 411 slash New York on this. We have the Board of Elections on it. We have um, the early voting pamphlet and where are your poll places pamphlet. And then we said, you know, we're going into these neighborhoods. Perhaps we ought to wear all our league identifiers. So we have league um, tote bags and scarves and banners and name tags, um, which actually turned out to be very useful. Next, we took Google Maps with the, with the Board of Elections map and actually sketched what the ED looks like. So this is another ED from, this is one of the EDs from Newcastle. Um, and we discovered that, you know, before we went, we actually reconnoitered. We said, before we go here, let's see what it's like. We discovered some of the 0% uh, turnout were cemeteries, the Mil Belmont Raceway, a couple of industrial parks where we couldn't figure out how anybody lived there. Did it with the cemeteries. We didn't understand why anybody would be registered there. But mm -hmm. what we, ended up doing is finding a lot of neighborhoods where people were 20 to 30% turnout. Um, in this case, it's single family, small lots. Um, and we took us about 30 knocks an hour. We did it in pairs. Um, and we got about 20 to 30% of the doors opened. Um, when we have canvassed in other neighborhoods with larger acreage or slightly more rural, obviously you can't knock as many doors per hour. Um, our numbers were about one new voter and six conversations an hour. And as you can see, we went out in pairs. Fran is not shown, she's the photographer here. Um, and it took a lot of hours. So what happened? So we did that in 2018. In 2019, we saw the results in the 2018 election, which in New York set records. Um, so in 2018, uh, three of the precincts that we dealt with had a 25% turnout. In 2019, those three EDs were 56 to 64%. Now that was not all us because in fact, Part of what we did is everybody who was out organizing, we suggested, hey, why don't you do Newcastle? Why don't you do Elmont? Those are low turnout areas. And a lot of people, a lot of other organizations, partisan and other, took us up on it. So we were not the only ones knocking on doors. In 2018, people said, why do you ask me to vote, but don't tell me who to vote for? What are you selling? And who are you? And a few people said, no one has ever come to my door before to ask me to vote. And we said, well, will you vote? And they said, yeah, now that I think about it. We showed people how to use their phone to check their registration. And some people then called all their relatives to check their registrations. Um, in our district, there are a lot of undocumented immigrants and, and non-citizen immigrants. So we tended when we were at the door to say, we're from the league, we are looking to register people to vote. As you know, in order to vote, you need to be a citizen, you need to be 18 by election day, and you need to live in this house for, for 30 days. Are there people in your house who are registered voters 
or who should be registered voters um, just by way of being diplomatic about who was who was uh, living there. In 2019, in the very same neighborhoods, I can't tell you it's the same doors, but in the same neighborhoods, um, we had people say, so who do you want? So do you want me to vote for candidate X? That's what the other people wanted. And we'd say, no, we're just asking you to vote. Yes. And then we had some people say, we're voters in this house. I see to it. Can I have another registration form for my son, for my neighbor, for my daughter-in-law? And then we frequently had people say, thank you for doing this. This neighborhood needs to vote for. Um, it was actually kind of amazing how many people said when we were doing it in 2019, so who would we be voting for? Because is it a presidential election this fall? And we'd say, actually, it's a local election. Um, these, are the, these are the local offices, and we point to our door hanger. Um, do you know what these offices do? What are, the, what are the issues in your neighborhood? Potholes, safety, garbage pickup. And they would start telling us. And we'd say, yes, this person or this person. And if your neighbors care, you may want to be able to call this person and say, this elected official, and say, we need this. And some people had never called an elected official before and were quite curious about how to do that. And luckily we have, our league has brochures, which lists every elected official in Nassau County, which was very easy to hand out for people who cared. Now, 2020, what next? So we were all happy with the plan and we registered for this caucus and then the pandemic hit and door to door is probably an issue. So in thinking about how to do this, one of the interesting things is that not only could we foil for the can canvassing book and for the maps, but you can vote foil for voter records. So this undoubtedly varies by state but in New York, you ask for a specific district. We'll ask for Senate District 7 because that's, that's larger than our catchment area, but approximately adjacent. We'll ask for the name of the voter, the address, the telephone, the voting history, and the gender and the age. Um, and I, this is, it looks a little bit like this. I haven't received it yet, although it was four weeks ago that I asked for it. Um, but we'll get something like that electronically. We will, through the magic of uh, having somebody who's techie, turn it into an Excel sheet. Um, and then we will try making phone calls to the neighborhoods that are the lowest turnout. We assume we will need to track calls because while we'll begin by saying we're the league and we're looking for to make sure everybody in your household is registered and that they're intending to vote, um, we may also want to be asking them, do you need voter registration forms? Do you need an application for an absentee ballot? Are you interested in early voting information? Because I assume we could drop by and drop things off to them, uh, socially distanced, um, after making those phone calls. Um, we may well do door hangers and some of the literature without knocking. Um, and possibly if we're making the phone calls, we may also ask them about are there any social organizations or faith communities where it would be useful for voter turnout to happen and see what people tell us. So that's the, that's the gist, that's the gist, that's the gist of what is kind of technical. How do you actually do this? What does a foil look like? We can answer you after the caucus, because some of those things are, it depends on your state, but we can give you the sense of it. So now we would like to open it up to discussion. Uh, and I'm gonna get rid of this slide in a few minutes, but for those of you who want questions about this presentation that are more technical, please put your questions in the chat or the Facebook messages, and we'll get back to you. For those of you who actually made it into this tiny Zoom meeting, um, 
who are planning to do get out the vote this fall, do you have any plans or techniques you want to share or what challenges you see, what experiences and ideas? What we'd like, what we're thinking makes sense is that if everybody who might want to offer something uh, turns their, everybody keep your, your mics off. If you want to offer something, um, turn your camera on so that those people who are interested in speaking have their camera on, but please put things in the chat so we can help choose you. I'm gonna ask Michelle and Francine to help with this. So if people could, let's see. I want everybody muted. I want, so, let's figure out how to, Yep. Uh, uh, fact. Uh, so, so I'm seeing a number of people in the chat talking about, about Michelle and Fran, you won't be looking to. I'm seeing you talking about how you do it without a pandemic. Does anybody have some ideas on what we could do that would be uh... so postcards with the vote with the voter list uh, looking at including voting history, we could select to send postcards. Uh, to those people with poor voting histories. Or although there is a report that I started this with by the Knight Foundation where they interviewed a hundred million not well, they interviewed the representatives of a hundred million non-voters and seldom voters. And apparently getting seldom voters to vote is much better odds and faster than getting non-voters to vote. Um, Michelle, do I have to unmute you? I, I'm unmuting myself and I can see in the chat is, does Becky Simon, would you like to share live? Cause I'm kind of going through the chats. We'd like, we'd love to hear a little bit about that. And then I'll, I'll go through and see cause a number of people are posting. So we'd love to hear more about what you're doing. If Becky, if you're there, if you unmute yourself, it should work. We have a program stroll to the polls. The name is kind of deceptive. It was begun back when we just had members who were mothers with a lot of little children in strollers. So they would go canvassing door to door with their children in the strollers. Our current version of this program uses a partnership with high school students in Illinois. We have mandatory civics education in high schools. So those students go and teams door to door encouraging people to vote several weeks before the actual election. It has a measurable impact on voter turnout in low turnout precincts. In Illinois, they're called precincts. That's, that's very cool. Um, somebody else? Do we have Rebecca Rolf? Rolf, if I'm mispronouncing your name. <laughs> it's Rolfus. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, we're doing a whole combination of things and we have, we're a fairly new league. So we never did this with any other way. Coronavirus is all we know. Um, so we're trying to do a combination of what I'm calling high tech, high touch. So there's going to be a social media campaign. There's going to be text banking. There's going to be a lot of things. We are buying the list of our lowest, um, districts in coastal Georgia. And um, so some of that will be phone calling, some of it will be postcards. I love this idea of door hangers because I don't know about you all, but one of the problems we have here is that the districts that tend to be low turnout are heavily African-American and people of color and our membership is not diverse enough at all. And so, uh, 
we are not the people you want to see in your neighborhood. Um, so I'm, we're thinking that postcards, phone calls, text banking, social media will work better. We're also working with several senior citizens organizations here, things like Meals on Wheels, to put an insert into the meal, um, how to request an absentee ballot, and do you need help filling it out? That sounds great. Uh, what about Rachel Loveman? Can you unmute yourself? Oh, maybe we have to unmute her. Sorry. We have to Can you hear me? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we just learned of a tool called Map the Vote. Um, I was on a, a webinar with Nonprofit Vote, I believe it was last week. And this tool was created, um, I believe in 2018. Anybody can go online and it just takes two seconds. You do have to supply a name and an email address. And then you can type in any address and it will show you a, a, a kind of like a Google map and it will have these little, um, I think it's blue or green pins on homes that do not have registered voters. Um, so you, if you are wanting to go around to neighborhoods and be strategic about it, um, you know, and you can't get the list through your local officials, that's one way to do it. And we're thinking of, um, I'm in Indianapolis, we're thinking of maybe partnering with the Indianapolis Neighborhood Resource Center, which kind of has links to all the neighborhoods. Um, but I, yeah, I, again, I love the, the idea of uh, hangers and things like that because I'm not sure how much we'll be able to do with all the COVID, so. But, I, but it's a really neat tool if you, if you wanna take two minutes and look it up. It's, it's uh, just called Map the Vote. Thank you, we'll put that in our notes to folks. Um, Mary Han, would you like to unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, we are in Arlington Heights, Illinois, and we actually are um, taking, um, kind of doing a copycat of what Naperville is doing. And we've already done it with one high school in our area for our primaries. Um, we did a stroll to the polls for them, and we also did it for a middle school um, as well and we were very successful with the younger students i'm not really sure if it was the weather or not but it seems like um people will open their doors to younger people i think more than they will for an adult so we're looking forward to doing something similar this fall with six or seven of the high schools in our local area and we're just planning it now we are going to be using door hangers we're going to be doing um, a little bit of um, putting posters that the middle school students are going to be making for us into local businesses to um, and provide with provide voting information, um, you know, where to vote, how to vote, the three different ways of voting, either um, by mail or early or in person the day of. So we're really looking forward to it and we really appreciate the um, guidance we've gotten from the Naperville League. That, that's interesting. Actually, I've, I've done a fair amount of canvassing with people and I have canvassed with some friends who trail their young children around. Uh, and it is amazing how people will stop and chat. And one woman had an infant strapped on her chest and virtually everybody stopped and said, you're doing this with an infant? And she said, I believe in it. And it made a difference. Um, one of the things I think that helps with all our regalia, star scarves and things, is we knock on the door and then step back so that it is clear we're not going to rush the door. And in neighborhoods of color, there is something about two white women who look like the American flag, you know, coming up to your door. You just have to make sure you don't look like ice. So, um, so uh, is Mary Han next or uh, you? That was Mary. Leonette Slay, and you on YouTube. Yes, uh, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and I just uh, our league just took a hundred absentee applications down to an urban ministry in in 
the western part of Birmingham. We're going to take 175 and put them in sacks of a local community of faith who does a food pantry the first Wednesday of the month. We have a runoff primary of the United States Senate on the 14th of July. We have municipal elections in August. And we have, of course, the national election and a U the US Senate race in November. So absent uh, some of these great ideas we're hearing this afternoon, we are going to be stuffing a lot of, of absentee app of applications in, in various places because Alabama makes it hard to vote absentee and you have to know all the rules before you can successfully run that gamut. We in New York are empathetic because New York, used to, people used to say we had the among the worst rules. It doesn't look like voter suppression. We didn't think a liberal state would do that, but yes, lots of states are really good at this. Um, and thank you. So Christine Campbell Gabor. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. A little louder. A little louder. Um, thank you. Um, our civics education team and speech speaker bureau team are trying to address some of these issues, especially with the pandemic going on. And so we work closely with the schools. We have something called Government B, which is questions about the government rather than the spelling B. It is so well received. We can do it. Um, virtually or in the schools. We give prizes. We do We the People and National History Day. We've also created a number of learning tools that we share, mini crossword puzzle booklets, uh, critical thinking worksheets. Um, our community outreach is really changing. So for example, the Speakers Bureau and forums are a team. That team is very diverse. And so when we give presentations, the two people that go out don't look alike. They might be different in background. They might be different in age group. We find it makes a huge difference in reaching. We have a community outreach team. Um, our presentations, five key presentations are, are translated into Creole and Spanish. And we have people from those communities giving those presentations. We find it better than going and putting things on doors because what we're doing is we're getting um, people to come in our young leaguers are reaching the, the, the people that they didn't normally reach using social media with a whole bunch of fun videos, which are really well liked. And mapping the vote and following up is really important with us for vote by mail. And so we have a number of initiatives. If anybody wants to share any of that, uh, Christine Campbell, the board's a long name, you'll remember it. <laughs> Just contact. That, that would be terrific. Can you put the some of that and we're, and how to contact you in the chat box and then we will we will make sure that the we will organize the chat and send it out to all of you who want it wonderful and judy if you'd let me know your last name so i could say who the speaker is in my report i just see judy new york esther quest e-s-t-e-r-q-u-e-s-t -E -E shoshana i'll do that again if people really want it shoshana it. uh you want to unmute yourself or I guess we have to unmute you. Sure. Um, I want to give a special shout out to the Naperville uh, League. They helped us tremendously to get our Stroll to the Polls program going to Highland Park, Highwood, Illinois. And we were helped immensely by um, our sisters in Arlington Heights who came out on March 8th, and mind you, that was three days before the lockdown, right? We just made it under the wire. Uh, we could not have done it without the cooperation and the help of these very kind, generous people. So um, we um, organized with the civics department at the high school. They were very enthused. It was almost as if they took over, which was fantastic. And um, they taught registration and voting. They taught about why it was so important. They signed up kids. We had 110 students walking uh, the streets of Highwood and Highland Park, knocking on doors, um, talking. They were keeping some statistics. They had a script about what they were supposed to be saying. They left door hangers, and the door hangers were in English and in Spanish, Spanish on one side, English on the other with all the pertinent information. The school provided buses. 
we had routing, we had teachers, everybody was coordinating with everybody else. It was hugely successful to the point that when they got back to the school for a rally of pizza and, you know, and talking, uh, the teachers immediately signed up for another date, which was supposed to be in October. And three days later, we had the shutdown. So we are now in conversation with the school about how they are going to uh, teach this, how they're going to get the kids involved. We presented the idea of the postcard campaign, and um, they were very appreciative for that. We need funding. Uh, the school, uh, because it was a school project before, um, they were able to help us with funding, but we need funding for this. I'm always looking for sources. Our, we're trying to decide whether we're going to do a bulk mailing. Um, if we have uh, addresses on one side of the face of the postcard and a handwritten, you know, I'm John from senior at Highland Park High School, you're my neighbor, and whatever our sign is, whether it's I care, your vote matters, get out your vote, your vote is your voice, whatever it is, and on the back we'll have information um, about where what they can do to register to get a mail-in ballot. So that is our hope. We have a lot of work to put this together. We have to decide uh, the frame of it. How many postcards do we want? What is our budget? We're just at the beginning. Um, and I think this year we're going to have even more of a turnout at the school because of what's been happening in our country, which is amazing. In our own little community, we have kids from Highland Park High School and Deerfield High School organizing events, get out the vote events and uh, raising uh, social consciousness in both the parks in Highland Park and in Deerfield. They have been fabulous, fabulous. So I think there's a great deal of excitement. And of course, my focus is always to figure out how to get younger members. So. Thank you, Shoshana, that was amazing. Um, Jackie Coolidge, can you unmute yourself or can we unmute her? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just uh, admiring your scarf and wondering if it came from my home league, Montgomery County, Maryland. We were selling were you that. selling it two years ago? If so, yes. Yes, at the convention, and I think there yes. will be more on wares. Yay, thank you. So fabulous. Yes, I recommend them to everybody. Good. <laughs> um, is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, I would just say that I am just delighted to hear about all of this, and uh, I am going to share it widely because I think this is just, you know, really, really good, positive examples of how we can really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Ingrid from Madison, Wisconsin. Could you unmute yourself or be unmuted? Can you hear me Someone now? Is happening mysteriously. So, yep, we can hear you. So uh, we, in conjunction with the NAACP here, have operated a lot of canvassing efforts in the past, which are now on hold. And so we are switching gears to a lot of social media where um, we hope to be able to pay a, a social media expert to do targeting for us by uh, it, b block by block so that we can target uh, low turnout areas. Um, we are uh, hiring people to do a lot of fancy videos that are cute and attractive. Uh, one thing our media consultant told us just recently is that the fastest growing segment on Facebook is the group 64 and older. Um, so uh, we're gonna add some stuff more designed for seniors than we had originally thought. So um, we also operate um, a helpline that is statewide in Wisconsin, but in Dane County, we're, we're taking out, we're using a lot of this advertising to try and get people aware of the helpline and get people aware of the fact that there are a couple of elections coming up and that uh, you can call 24 hours a day and we'll respond to your questions about voting. That's amazing. Thanks. 
I got sure I would sign up for 24 seven. Um, what I would also say is that it's interesting to talk about local elections as well as presidential elections, because mm -hmm. I think it is sometimes more straightforward to make a case for local, for, for how much your vote matters in a local election. We've had a number of local elections in, you know, within 10 miles of us that have been decided by one vote, two votes, eight votes, and that actually makes a difference to people. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I'm going to jump in for one second, Judy. Yeah, this, well, I would definitely um, back up what Judy said. Um, many times, I think, I know there was a little bit in the chat about um, whether or not we heard people saying there was no one good, worthwhile to vote for. I personally didn't get that as many times, but I did get a little bit of the why does my vote matter? And I think really bringing it back to the local elections, because we the first time I canvassed was... Um, with Judy and Fran was an off, it was an off cycle year, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a congressional election, it wasn't a presidential. And so there were really these state races that were up. And so we were able to kind of reiterate to people that even though the federal races many times are more, seem more exciting or you see them on TV more, that really much of the issues that affected them day to day were really decided by state and local government. And so we talked about things like schools and as Judy mentioned, your potholes, you know, things that your roads, um, you know, the services, whether your pool in the, your town was available or open, that type of thing. And so I hope that made a difference. The other thing that I saw a number of comments on in the chat, which Judy probably didn't see since she's moderating, um, there was a question about cost. We can't remember the exact cost, but we, I think that there, I want to say that the door hangers were probably about $500 and we rushed them. Um, so if you planned a little bit further in advance, they, that could probably be a little bit cheaper. We did, um, as Judy mentioned, we did provide stamps. So there was the stamp cost. Fran bought a ton of stamps. So that was probably a couple hundred. I mean, that could have been like $500 right there. But you could, you know, you don't, the stamps were nice, but not, you didn't need to have those. The other question that I saw in the chat was um, days and times that we did door knocking. And we did, at least the times that I went, um, we did Sunday afternoons, and that was after historically black churches are usually done with their services for the day, so we didn't want to go too early. Um, and we went kind of, I want to say like two to six. We, um, we tried Saturdays and Sundays, and we'd aim for 1.30 or two, and we'd meet in the parking lot, and it always took us a while. So we actually were knocking on doors probably two to six two to five or two to five thirty that's a lot of walking around and knocking on doors i mean we got tired but it yeah. was weekends afternoon and then we try a couple of us tried weekday afternoons now this was before the pandemic when everybody was home between about five thirty and seven thirty um and you get a different set of people there but uh you know I don't know when the right time to go is. It, it varies, but it's typically about 30%, 20 to 30% will open the door. And I'm seeing a question that just popped up too that was a question about how many door knockers we got for the money. I want to say like thousands. I like, think Fran got a thousand from a print shop that liked us for about six or 700, but I think that was Rush. And I know when I bought the second set, which was probably 500, it was close to $500, it was probably 400, but he did it in three days. So what I would recommend is give the local printer two or three weeks so you don't get scalped. But we had a problem that our local, who was running happened rather suddenly. I don't remember what the issue was, but the local races suddenly happened when we were doing this. And we said, we should make sure people know this. Um, and I think a funny aside that, that Frank could probably share is we were actually, um, our board is nonpartisan. Some of our volunteers and members have obviously worked on other campaigns. And we were told by one of the major parties that that was a waste of time to go into the neighborhood that we went into. And it actually wound up being the, it was a pitch made to get that individual to be canvassing in different neighborhoods for that party. And actually when the returns came back, the neighborhood that we canvassed in had really paid off in terms of, you know, I think it adds to our, um, 
our credence that we really, we're not telling you to vote for anyone, we're just asking you to vote. The other piece of information that we had with us is we checked to make sure people knew where their polling place was. So if they told us they were planning on voting, we asked them if they knew where they were gonna vote and we had a list of where those polling sites were just to make sure that they had the most up-to-date information about where they should be going. Because one of the things New York likes to do is change your polling place randomly. Maybe it's not random, but it feels random. So people would say, oh, yes, I always vote at the firehouse. And then it would turn out to be the gym. And they would go the middle school gym. No, the high school gym. Really? I've never voted at the high school gym. You know, welcome to New York. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with Michelle. It was amazing how many candidates um basically every time there was a group of people either collecting money or organizing things where i went i would say by the way the league is canvassing in these areas and i did not hear a single candidate or campaign manager say that was anything other than a stupid idea because those people don't vote well guess what if you don't ask them they don't vote so and Catherine Murphy, I saw that you had some kind of interesting comments too about local, state, and primary elections. Do you want to chime in with that for people who aren't following the chat as much? Uh, sure. Um, so local, state, and primary elections are really important. Primary elections in Washington state where we have mail-in ballots, which is a little different. But in 2016, in one of our counties, the county I was living in there, only 39% of registered voters voted in primary elections. There were nine state offices on that primary ballot, over 100 candidates. If you don't vote in primary elections, that's where new candidates come in. And so the focus of what we did is we had meetings in the library to encourage people to vote. We didn't do the tracking because that we were a new league doing stuff. But getting people to understand that in primary elections and local elections, your votes are very close together sometimes and that they really do make a difference. And we have several examples in Washington and I use those and it surprises people. The other thing is if you tell people the turnout numbers and you explain that 25% of the people aren't registered so that only 20% people are deciding in primary elections, people go, oh, really, I had no idea. And so that helps them vote without being shamed. We also mentioned to young people that there are 30 million people between 18 and 30 and about 30 million who are over 60. And the difference in turnout is about two to one or three to one. Do you really want your grandparents choosing politicians who are going to determine clean water, clean air, and various other things you might care about. And they are shocked that old people vote three times as old. They're shocked that they have the numbers that equal seniors. Can I ask, um, one of the things that's kind of an issue is how do, you, how do you do this for rural areas where I can't imagine how you do it? And how would you do it for apartment buildings? Has anybody got some thoughts on that? You might put your camera on and wave or something. Or raise your hand if that's like or a I'll look for you. Leslie, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, yeah. Uh, um, I'm from the New York City League. Thank you very much. Very nice to be with our partners in Long Island and across the country. Um, so, you know, I was just thinking, given what we're talking about, about the door hangers, we collaborate a lot with NYCHA. And for those of you who don't know, NYCHA is the New York City Housing Authority and they handle all the public housing in New York City. Um, and I think the door hangers idea is actually a really good way to get into the apartment buildings. You know, you can also, for non-public housing, approach management offices, see if, you know, if we've got volunteers who actually live in those areas, we could potentially tap on them as well to kind of work with the door hangers. I, I don't know that people in New York City often open their doors to people who knock on them. But I think to your point, things like door hangers, postcard campaigns, and we have done postcard campaigns in the past to low turnout areas that have been successful. That's interesting, that might work here because it wouldn't actually take yeah. that much work to do it, would be the addressing. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody else, rural or apartment buildings? Or Catherine Murphy, do you want to talk about um, your idea with postcards? 
So what we decided to do, and we got a state grant to do this, we, we're going to print 20, 3,000 postcards. We have a database that we can look at and find out people who have either not voted since 2016 or have only voted once. We're sending a postcard to every one of those addresses that represents 3,200 voters. I live in a county with only 47,000 people. Where are you from? Uh, Washington State, Ellensburg, Washington, and Kittitas. And so we're going to send them out. That's, a, that's how we're doing it. And then in addition, I have an additional grant to um, put those postcards into all different kinds of diverse areas, uh, the food bank, uh, the high schools, the college, so that we can get those postcards out to people so that we can increase the voting in those areas. And then we'll see if the vote increased based on the postcards. So you're, and printing, you're printing the message about voting and then you're handwriting the addresses or how are you doing that? Uh, no, we're going to get the addresses printed because we have them from a database. And okay. uh, we have QR codes that take people straight. You can register online in Washington State and we're a votes, uh, mail, mail voting state. And we also have a QR code for our, our local league where we have um, all kinds of candidate information. So we're giving them two pieces of information on a nice postcard. That's and I'm gonna cool. ask you, Catherine, one of the questions that we've seen too is what are you putting on the postcards? People would like um, to know on them. I don't have, on the front it says something, use your outside voice, I can't remember what it says. On the other side, it says the election is this date, uh, you can register even same day, please use this QR code. In our state, we have a great, um, system of, of, of uh, it's voter access is really important. So it's unlike other states that are represented on this call. But here in a, in a rural area, it's difficult for us to get, we were thinking about doing postcards even before the pandemic, because getting out to the farms and stuff, it's a big county and not a lot of people. And I'd say one of the other ideas that we've seen, um, although with another organization, um, which is, is um, a wound up having a little, little bit of a partisan bet, so we did not do it with them, but people writing um, little notes on the postcards too, or personal letters to people who haven't written in low turnout areas, and you could do that either in your own state or in different states. There are ways to access those lists, but I want to make sure we get to Lynette Slay. She has an issue, she has um, some information or ideas about how to do, um, get out the vote in rural southern areas. So Lynette, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, although I live in Birmingham, my family is in rural Mississippi and I've just spent two weeks there. And I think this is a real challenge because the library is still closed in a lot of these little towns. And that's what the real community centers are now for, because of the free computer and other services that are provided there specifically in the summer for children. And so I would say that the challenge would be to again, go through your faith communities some of them are opening up in rural areas and see if you can't put some information through their social media and also through their food pantries and other ways to put hard copy applications and instructions so that people know that elections are coming up and what the deadlines are because the absentee application itself is for a variety of elections and you don't know when the deadline is to turn in your application unless you go to a Secretary of State website, which many people can't do. So I think it's a real challenge for rural areas. Wow, that's, I think that's right. Uh, New York also has, used to have about nine deadlines a year for the various things. And one of our reforms has got it down to about four deadlines, five deadlines but getting the deadlines right is a big issue. I like the idea of doing hard copy through food pantries and faith. I'm wondering if some of the faith communities have people who go door to door the way Meals on Wheels do, and they might be willing to discuss it with folks. Uh, someone else? Uh, Suzanne. Hi, um, I'm also, um, I'm from New York State, but I'm also from New York City. And uh, one of the projects that um, we keep going in my neighborhood that the league started um, in New York City is we make little posters that people in apartment buildings, of which we have many, 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 can put up in their elevators, in their laundry rooms, in their community spaces, and you can use a variety, last day to register to vote with information of how to do that. Um, the list of early voting 
times and where your polling place is. Because unfortunately in New York City, a lot of the early voting places were not the same as your regular polling place. Uh, they made it as confusing as possible, as Judy well knows. Um, so we have, used, we have used these and we're starting, we publish them in a tool, tool kit at the state level to inspire, you know, hope other, our local leagues will use these to post. And then you can also post the poll site because generally an apartment building will all go to the same poll site. And um, that's been, I, I know the people who live in apartment buildings who have posted them, people generally thank them for the information. And peer pressure, never, never underestimate peer pressure. And that's what you can get going in an apartment building. That actually sounds like a very good idea because apparently with seldom voters, some of the research, this is not the Knight Foundation, says that if you ask if, if six people that you know ask you, are you going to vote? The peer pressure starts becoming so people vote. Um, I'm also thinking that the poster that has, so, so in New York, it's an issue because the early polling sites are typically, I mean, Long Island, none of them were regular polling sites. Uh, and I know in a couple of the other upstate counties, none of them were. Um, and I think some posters that you could put in stores or dry cleaners or grocery stores might be a really good thing to do uh, where people will see it. Um, we're coming up on the hour. Are there a couple of people that want to do a final comment? Do I see any hands? This has been, oh, Leonette, did you raise your hand? Um, uh, so I am very happy with all the things that you said. This has been really useful to us. We've learned a lot and we will try to figure out the chat and send you and send you what we've got. Um, if there's anything in particular, do reach out and let us know so we can try to help on that. And thank you. It's been fun. Uh,